All right, it is 11.30 a.m. Eastern. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ask the Expert session for the Systems Engineering and Hardware track. We have a panel of experts here who are here to answer all your questions around systems and networking. So please put in all your questions into the chat uh, and we will field them as we see them. Um, I'm gonna hand that over to you now, Aaron. Please take over. And thank you all for doing this. All right, thanks, Arvashi. Um, so on the panel, we have Wyman Long, uh, Prarat Bhargava, Thomas Haller, and Dan Winship. Uh, so we have a good mix of sort of networking expertise, both in sort of the desktop server as well as cloud and kernel expertise. So uh, feel free to ask questions anywhere you want. And if no one can answer them, then sorry. Um, first question, we'll just get right into it. So first question is from Richard Jones. Um, are you following risk five and what effect might it have on the server landscape? I'll take a shot at answering that. Um, Richard, that's a great question. Uh, historically, we, we've seen a little bit of, of interest in, in risk, risk five over the years, uh, over the past little while, rather. Um, it's, it's, we're, I'm following it purely from a point of view that, that it may become something, uh, may become a product, it may, be, may become something more, more real someday. Adding another architecture is, is as always, very interesting at Red Hat. Uh, it takes, uh, it's not just an engineering effort. There's QE, there's productization, documentation, and everything that's involved in there. Once we see enough uh, interest from partners and customers, that's when we'll have a real serious uh, discussion about RISC-V. I guess along that, um, there are some efforts to have data centers that are non um, x86. And I guess there are some challenges uh, related to that, both from a networking side and a, um, and a, just a systems uh, execution side. So are there any uh, special considerations from networking or, or systems that, that we have to uh, keep in mind? Sorry, Aaron, my, my screen just uh, went out and I heard the very end of that. Could you repeat that? My apologies. Yeah, so there's sort of a, other data centers that are starting to migrate to non-Intel hardware and um, that can bring its own challenges. And what sort of considerations do we have to have um, from systems and networking side uh, sort of when thinking about running sort of the, the full a full solution like um, not just you know say kernel and OS utilities but like the networking side and and like you know hardware enablement and offload enablement all that sort of stuff what what are, what are the things we have to keep in mind as special considerations well I think from from a I'm, I'm primarily kernel focused and so I, I always like to say we're the uh, bottom of the pile as it, as it relates to the, the rest of the stack. Um, we, we try for parity uh, uh, across all our architectures uh, with our product with our products. So it doesn't matter which uh, what architecture you're running. Uh, that again takes effort. It's not just a kind of snap your fingers and, and hope it works uh, kind of kind of effort. Um, there are things like we we have to make sure that the drivers and the devices that these systems uh, adopt are maintainable. Uh, we've had in the past where uh, some drivers have come in on some architectures and could not be maintained for long periods of time. We also have to look at the overall uh, 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 specific purpose of some of these processors. Risk Five, for example, as you've noted, it has a very much a server uh, 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 footprint. 
uh, whereas uh, ARM, it was hoped, would have uh, both a server and a uh, laptop uh, uh, footprint. So I think those types of things definitely play into the decisions that are made. Um, there, there are technical issues throughout the stack that I could get into, but I, I think I would potentially bore everybody on this call. Uh, so I don't want to get too far into that. Uh, and with that long rambling answer, I'll, I'll end it there. So I work on OpenShift networking um, and you know, from our perspective, we just you know, use the features that the kernel gives us. So if, if, if RHEL starts supporting other architectures, then we can support them at the higher levels. And yeah, we don't really even notice architecture that much. Okay. Um, any other questions? It's a pretty short panel so far. Maybe, um, like Thomas and Dan, you can talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in uh, like server side networking developments. Um, I, I, I can say something. I, I work on network manager and in general in the the, the management of, of networking in, in RHEL. So the what we want to do is that network manager is the component for configuring networking on, on the Linux host. And there are there is a, there are other components on top of that 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 use the API that Network Manager provides, and and I, I think the, the point is that we believe Network Manager should be this user space component that provides an API to other components. So on top of that, we have an, another project. It's called NM State, which is kind of a simple. It provides a, a different API to applications. And yes. that's it, I think. For instance, in OpenShift, we're looking at using NM state because people have various complicated networking configurations on their, their and their clusters, and we don't want everybody running, you know, if config or whatever on, on their OpenShift nodes doing random strange things to the network. So NM state is great because it lets them just sort of declaratively explain their networking configuration and then we can get that set up. That's that's still a few releases in the future for us. But. Um, so someone is just asking, uh, I am part of OpenShift support team and could see we are now moving to OVN from OBS. How do we see OVN helping us moving away from IP tables? What if the North Deep pods go down? Do they have any mechanism to come up without causing any network disruptions? Um, okay, so moving from o or to OVN from OVS. So the, the current OpenShift network plugin, OpenShift SDN, is built on, on raw OVS, basically. OVN is also built on OVS. It's just a, another layer of, a, of abstraction on top of it. So yeah, um, in uh, OpenShift 4.6, which is coming out this fall, uh, OVN will be, OVN Kubernetes, the, the plugin, will be uh, GA. Um, how do we see OVN helping us moving away from IP tables? I mean, OVN Kubernetes doesn't use IP tables at all. Um, OpenShift SDN and a lot of other Kubernetes network plugins um, use IP tables to do all the service proxying. And so in a very large cluster, you can have tens of thousands of IP tables rules and things get kind of slow after a while and it causes problems. Uh, OVN Kubernetes uses OVN flows, which compile down to OVS uh, OpenFlow to do all of the, the load balancing stuff. Um, so in, it doesn't have the IP tables problems. It you know, is having some problems of its own. We're working through those. 
uh, fixing performance issues. Uh, but yeah, I mean, basically, if you're using OVN and Kubernetes, you are moved away from IP tables. It, it uses maybe like 10 IP tables rules total. Um, what if the North Tea pods go down? So um, one problem that, that we had had with OpenShift SDN even is that when doing a cluster upgrade, uh, every node gets restarted, every pod gets restarted. And when you restart the OVS pods, that causes disruption because when OVS isn't running, uh, it, it can't be routing traffic. Um, so we eventually moved to an architecture where instead of running OVS in pods, we finally moved it back into the system image. So it actually runs as a system D service on the node rather than uh, as a pod. And so that way it only gets restarted when the node itself gets restarted when there are no pods on. And so it doesn't interrupt the traffic. So the idea is, is the same with OVN, that anything that is, is actually critical to the routing of traffic runs on the node itself. Uh, in the North D case, if the North D pods go down, that means we can't make changes to the network uh, connectivity, whatever, until they come back up. But North D isn't actually needed to keep the packets flowing. So if North D goes down, uh, you know, the, the API server, the scheduler, or whatever, notices that, oh, it's gone down, uh, start a new North D pod. And it just does that and, and it works because the network will still be there. Um, uh, I guess there is some trickiness with something has to tell North D about the new pod. But um, the North D is run in, in HA mode. So as long as all three North D pods don't go down at the same time, then you're fine. Um, and if all three North D pods do go down at the same time, you probably have bigger problems like you know, lightning strike or something. Uh, yeah. Okay. Further questions? Type them out. Thanks, Dan. I also wanted to point out that Till put a link uh, in the chat to NM State. So. Ah, okay. So, Prarit, tell us about Rel8. <laughs> um, I just noted, I was just scanning down the uh, people list, and I'll, I'll tell you this great story about this, this shirt. Um, this is actually one of my favorite Red Hat shirts. Denise Dumas gave this to me, and I saw her name in the, uh, in the uh, people list. So, she's you get, you get a nice big shout out, uh, and I'll do her an extra shout out. I don't know if she's doing a session on diversity at DevConf US, but if she is, everybody on this call needs to go and listen to what she says. Um, but uh, look, uh, you know, Rel8 is our primary product, uh, sorry, one of our primary products here at Red Hat. Um, we are working hard on Rel9, so uh, the shirt is almost out of date. Um, I'll need to ask Denise to uh, give me one. Oh, she, I just noticed this. She's giving everybody on this call, you have to go, you have to go, you have to go. Listen to what she says. Um, and uh, we're working hard on RHEL 9. Um, you know, RHEL 8 was an interesting process. RHEL 9 is going to be even more interesting. We're moving a lot of our development into more open areas. We're working right now with uh, CentOS Stream, uh, as people may have heard of uh, that as a uh, thing now. Uh, we're working on figuring out how we're going to work with CentOS Stream and what our development process will be with CentOS Stream. And that just doesn't go for the kernel. That goes for every uh, package uh, in RHEL is uh, going to be more outward facing. We are supposed to be an open source company and it's time we acted like one is uh, what I like saying to people these days. Um, it, it, RHEL 8 is uh, is humming along wonderfully. RHEL 9 is going to do the same, uh, is what I'll, what I'll say. Yeah, thanks. Um, and Denise's keynote is tomorrow at 9.30 a.m., so like Prarat said, should 
go and attend be quite good. All right. So Irvashi asks, what are some cool technologies that you all are working on in the systems and networking area? Things that people are not familiar in the area would like to know about. Let's make Wayman answer that. Yeah, let, let me start with that, OK? Um, um, I'm a kernel engineer I'm working mainly in the core kernel area including uh, locking um, uh, control group as well as some many uh, MM related stuff. Uh, right now I'm trying to backporting one of the upstream um, uh, memory signal changes that um, will help us to reduce the consumption of kernel memory in the kernel um, that will I hope uh, have uh, OpenShift to allow them to uh, um, to use to have more container with a given set amount of memory. The way that the the, the container work is, it make use of the uh, two kernel feature. Um, primarily, one is the the C group uh, to partition the resources in a, in in a system. The other one is namespace to isolate the name so that you won't. So that one container are not supposed to see our, our stop our name that are from a different container or from the from the whole system, and in and also in order to uh, for the in the case of um, memory C group, in order to control the amount of resource you are allowed to use in a container, um, you have to set up some kind of uh, limit like how much memory you are supposed to use, and. And that include uh, everything the, um, the the application within the container will consume, like the uh, all the uh, pay cache or the file buffer, and also all the um, internal data structure that the kernel maintain for for all the processes in, within the um, the container, and and the kernel memory that the current the system use is that um, each. Um, each container will have their own set of what we call the, the KMM cache. And with the KMM cache, in order to for have better performance, and you have also of uh, caches within the KMM cache, including the per CPU cache as well as per node cache. And it's those caches that can consume quite a bit of memory. Um, so right now, um, each container, or specifically each memory SQL, have their own set of uh, KMM cache. And so, and there's no sharing between um, different container. And as a result, uh, you have consumed a lot more memory than you are actually using. Because some of the, the, the memory are being kept within the KMM cache as one, in the KMM cache, you, you allocate a set of pages for each, what, what we call a slab. And usually you, you are not going to use up everything uh, within the slab. So the, the free space left uh, cannot be used by other uh, container. Um, with the upcoming X4 kernel, we are going to backport a, a change that allow us to share the KMM cache between different containers. So instead of one, one cache for each container, we can have one single cache that are shared by all. And in this way, you, you, you reduce the consumption of memory by quite a bit, and which uh, hopefully will reduce the, um, the amount of memory consumed by each container. And so we, we hope we can have more container within uh, a system. And yeah, that is, um, that, that's it for me. So uh, I will let the other panelists uh, talk about what they are uh, doing for for the for the new releases. I guess I'll go next. Um, so right now I'm working a lot on uh, stack IPv4, IPv6 stuff in OpenShift. Um, I mean, I think that's that's pretty much a solved problem, like out there in the rest of the networking world, but. Uh, for Kubernetes, for a long time, it hasn't been able to do dual stack. Um, so Microsoft has been working on that a lot upstream 
to, to get dual stack support for Kubernetes on Azure. Um, and we've been working with them upstream. We're doing a lot of work in OVN Kubernetes and in OpenShift, getting all that working for various customers that need to do that. Um, really the big networking news in, in OpenShift these days is OVN though. I just talked about that. So I think that's about all, all I've got. Oh, okay, I can go next. I work on Network Manager, as I said, and well, Network Manager is a rather old project already, but I, I really have the feeling that each release kind of is better than before, so I'm very happy about that. And, and I think that is also attributed that we significantly improved our uh, continuous integration and testing over the past years. That that is not that is not a goal in itself, but it really helps that, that our software, I think, works better and more reliable. What I what I think is the, the great part here is that there are all these other components that that build on the API of Network Manager. That is, of course, the, the UI, but also, for example, there is Cockpit and there is integration with Ansible, and we want to do more with OpenShift and and these layered products. So I, I think in our team, we see Network Manager as this, this part of that provides the API for configuring the network. And, and I'm happy about this, uh, this position. I think it's right that there is one component that, that provides it. I mean, it, it provides something on top of what the kernel directly does, because in kernel, you just configure the the current networking interfaces and the IP addresses, but that's all just uh, for the moment. But then you need ways to persist this. And for that network match provides a, an API that is based on profiles. And, and I, I think it, it needs to be one central API in the sense that different components use the same, use the same uh, API so that they that when you configure something say with cockpit or with the ansible that it touches the same things so yes that's uh, that's what i enjoyed i think you're muted prior Uh, I'll speak a little bit about what's going on in, in some of the platform areas. Uh, as we all know, Intel is delayed at seven nanometer uh, for a little while. So they're putting some of those features into in existing uh, processors. Things like we're seeing with CPU frequency enhancements, things like uh, speed select technology, which instead of just allowing an entire processor or an entire core to uh, ramp up its frequency or decrease its frequency. We now have the ability to have user-selected cores uh, rise to user-selected frequencies. Uh, and it's even more than that. You can, you can modify the heuristic to work the way you want it to. Uh, we're seeing areas, uh, some areas of work in smart NICs, getting RHEL onto both the offload CPU and uh, uh, getting the uh, RHEL OS uh, involved there. NVMe and storage, things like persistent memory. I know we've tossed around the NVMe phrase for years, but it's now becoming really much more of a thing that we're seeing uh, even in lower end servers. There's a lot of effort around here about edge computing, um, going out to the edge and making sure RHEL and Linux run securely in those areas. So there's a lot of security work going on there. Uh, we also, uh, I, I noticed this in the title, it's called System, Engineering's and Har uh, System Engineering and Hardware. I almost wish it, I had a moment to yell at Aaron and say, hey, uh, change it to Systems Engineering and Platform. Uh, we're no longer just doing hardware here. Uh, we haven't been for, gosh, uh, 10 years, I'd say. Uh, 
we are a virtualiz virtualization company. We do deal with partner uh, uh, virtualization platforms. AWS, for example, runs uh, some of their systems run RHEL. Um, you know, uh, it's it's actually a big piece here at Red Hat to note that you can run in virtualized environments, containers, et cetera. So uh, there's a lot going on in platform and it's a constant change here. So just so that you don't stay mad at me, that systems engineering and <laughs> hardware is actually the name of the track, not the session. So it's not my oh, fault. Oh, is, is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is it? Who do I have to yell at to get them to change that next year? I, I don't know. Someone, <laughs> maybe Irvashi. Yeah. Um, I guess okay. I, I can answer that question as well a little bit from the OVS side since we talked a little bit about it. One of the cool things from the more recent OVS um, releases is um, this support for like AFXDP um, interrupt mode on um, AFXDP ports. So that's like kind of cool. You can actually um, integrate with the cool buzzword technology that the that the kernel exposes. It's actually quite neat. Um, these XDP uh, interface for uh, or, or API. I don't really know what the best way of calling it is, but um, framework. Um, yeah, so that's kind of neat from the OVS side. There's a question, how will smart NICs with an OS embedded enable new platforms workloads? Uh, so this is something that, that we are keeping track of in OpenShift. Um, so OVN Kubernetes, the, the project to use OVN as a network plugin for Kubernetes and OpenShift was mostly started by people at NVIDIA who are, I don't, they're doing something with like giant clusters of GPUs or something, uh, but they're really excited about smart NICs and, and have been uh, working on support for, for that in OV and Kubernetes with, um, I think Mellanox has cards that actually run OVS on the NIC um, entirely so that you can just offload all of your flow processing to the NIC rather than having to do any of it in CPU. Uh, and so they've been making sure that, that OVN supports that, which I'm pretty sure it does, like just the current code and Git master. The way we deploy it in, in OpenShift right now, that won't work, but we have a uh, enhancement proposal open to get that working for 4.7, I think. Thomas, does Network Manager have any uh, like special knobs or anything to integrate with any smart NICs? Uh, not, not really. It just uses the. The kernel abstracts this for the for the most part, so no, it doesn't. Also because it doesn't configure like flows directly. For that you would you would need OBS. Well, network manager can configure open vSwitch, but it it doesn't configure the flows itself. Yeah, I guess it just sets up bridges and, and ports. That's about it. So this question was, how will this enable new platforms and workloads? And well, I don't know exactly other than by being faster. Yeah. Are there, sh there, so David asks, is there a strong relationship between OVS and Ansible like Network Manager? Um, not that I'm aware. I, I don't know that there's anything that, uh, I don't know that there's any like uh, Ansible module or plugin or anything like that that is tightly coupled to OVS. There is a module, okay. Yeah, I know like, for us, um, so the, the biggest thing that's configuring OVS right now is OVN. And so a lot of the projects speak uh, to OVN. 
So for instance, like um, OpenStack and OpenShift, um, they, they sort of program up OVN and then OVN goes and programs up uh, OVS. So I don't know that there, I don't know that, I don't know what Ansible um, projects are, are doing. Okay, NM State supports OVS and has some Ansible support. Okay, cool. Does that include uh, programming flows? Sorry, now I'm asking you questions. Okay, just what NM supports. Okay. Possible there are as many experts in the audience as there are on our panel. All right, here's a question, since I don't see one posted yet. Um, what is, uh, what's a, a difficult systems or networking problem that you uh, ran into that you were never able to solve? I guess it's like an interview question too, but like, why not? I wanna hear what Wayman's answer is. He's so everybody knows he's known as one of the best engineers at Red Hat. And if there's a problem that he can't solve, I I, I would really like to hear what his answer is. Um. Well, I hmm. I can't think of any at the moment. Um. <laughs> uh, you were high enough. Um. We have at least um some way to. Either way, I want it or um, or password address it. Uh, I I would not say that you are able to solve every every problem that you have, but you just try your best to to make the best out of it. Okay, that that is my my philosophy. Yeah, yeah. There's some there's always something you can do, but it may not completely address your the issue or address the problem, but at least uh, give um, the customer some way to. Well, one want it or, or handle it in some way. You know, Wayman, that's that's very profound. I I think that a lot of our, a lot of engineers get stuck in the trap of I have to provide a solution, and at times there may not be a solution, a perfect solution. And getting something that just works or at least works around a problem that a customer or partner may have is very important to, and to be able to articulate that this isn't a perfect solution is also very important uh, there there are tons of cases at red hat that we deal with that are like that um, but in my case it tends to a lot be due to bro broken firmware uh, no one no customer or partner likes to hear that their firmware is broken uh, but I have to say that a lot of times and that the only fix, the only real fix they can have is to update their firmware. For me, it is sometimes to find, to, to model a problem like networking configuration that should be that, should, well, you want to have an API to configure all the network, 
but there, there is quite a lot of diversity in the in the technologies and the work and then to, up, to abstract this so that you can both implement it and say wow this is nice and simple and also that the api of the, the result of it is actually use useful and powerful at the same time so this i think is pretty hard Okay, this one is from uh, Marcelo to Thomas. How are things going in regards to Network Manager and Network D? Uh, I think they are going well. The well, for example, we don't cooperate so much, but for example, Network Manager consumes quite a lot of source code of System D it, to use the DHCP client from Network D. Currently, that. Currently, systemd doesn't provide this as a as a proper library, but instead we kind of fork parts of it. So it, it's that is actually quite useful. I, I think we also we didn't only use it; we also provided uh, patches for systemd for this for this part. Other than that, I think the network manager and networkd have a different focus and do different things. So. Both, I think both projects have their value, but are not directly, yeah. On RHEL, for example, we currently don't support system D network D. It's, it's excluded on RHEL 8. Because, uh, well, I guess the answer is that we, that we want to focus our effort in one solution and that, that it's, that, it would be better if we had one solution that works for a variety of scenarios instead of having two solutions that both have still their own uh, downsides. So. Yes, I, I don't know if that answered the question. But. We do re rely uh, on a lot of system D uh, components, right? I mean, we really like system D resolve D, which will be the default on, on Fedora 33 and and newer. And uh, uh, we also use system D hostname D. And of course, on RHEL, we run as a system D service. So in general, we think system D does great things. But there is a functional overlap with what network D does. All right. Is there anything anyone's looking forward to uh, in the future that they that they see coming up? Some new cool piece of technology. This is more of an old piece of technology, but we we, we will now be supporting SCTP in in OpenShift. So all of you who who were looking forward to that.
I am quite excited about Anim State. It's it's a new project which, and it I think it's, it shows a lot of promise. There is also a presentation by by Fernando about Anim State on on DevCon. I just don't know the time now. I'm I'm actually even though this isn't purely a uh, systems engineering issue, and I mentioned it before, I'm really looking forward to to Senta Senta Stream. Um, it's going to bring a lot of uh, non-traditional partners to the table for Red Hat to deal with the hardware. So the question from Ali is, I have a modified Linux kernel that works great on QMU, but not on hardware. What tips might you have for testing Linux on hardware and debugging it there? Ali, uh, uh, hopefully we can, you can just type your answers. Do you, are you getting far enough to get output from the kernel? Uh, or is it stuck in early boot? So I guess there's output coming. Let's turn it on, the application comes up. Okay. So when you boot it on hardware, one of the things you can do to find out what, what component, uh, there's, there's a couple of steps here. While running the application on this modified kernel, it barfs. I see. So it's a vanilla it's kernel? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I think I thought it was better if I just uh, connected directly. So yeah, uh, the application comes up uh, and <clears throat> uh, while running uh, running it on this modified hardware, uh, it works. I can see, uh, you know, a couple of uh, CPUs are uh, stuck so that uh, that gives me a problem after like 22 seconds i can see a few uh, uh, page faults uh, but what i'm actually looking for is the way i can uh, debug it on qmu i can connect uh, mm -hmm. uh, gdb to it uh, from the outside i can take memory uh, dumps and look at it through the uh, crash utility how do i do that on hardware or do you have any tips for doing those things so there is a there is kdump uh, that uh, uh, we have on in uh, all the uh, rel related kernels CentOS, uh, Fedora, and rel. So when when the system does panic, uh, you should be able to collect a kdump. And there's a utility called Crash, which you can use to run on that kdump. There's a lot of documentation about it uh, on. Uh, 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 Tons of websites. I think if you just do a search for uh, how to debug the Fedora kernel with Crash, you'll come across a couple of good hits about that. Yes, I've, I've used Crash before through QMU memory dumps. Yes. Can I ask the nature of the changes you made? Uh, so this is regarding the Unikernel Linux project, which I'll be presenting okay. today uh, as well. So this is basically the application linked in directly with the, and glibc linked in directly with the kernel. Uh, so everything runs in ring zero. Uh, and yep. when this application comes up, it starts running. It's a memcached application. Um, when we increase the load on the system, uh, then I see all these uh, behaviors that I do not see on QMU. So the way I've been debugging it on QMU is I can see all the uh, symbols, all the application symbols, glibc symbols, kernel symbols, on QMU, 
I can take memory dumps and look at it through uh, crash utility. Uh, but on hardware, uh, I'm just starting out, and that uh, I'm uh, there's no place for me actually to start. I see. The uh, I'm trying to think of what else I could give you. Um, um, may may I suggest something? Um, the the Linux kernel itself has a lot of debug capability. Uh, if you are uh, and then put it on the hardware and see what sort of um, debug message that it gave you, you may. You may give me some hint on um, what the problem is. For instance, in where we ship two set of kernel, we have a regular production kernel, this is for performance, and then we have a debug kernel that um, provide a lot more uh, debugging related message um, to, to allow you to figure out if there's something wrong with the system or the hardware. And also one thing is, um, well, QMU, they provide you only a set of very simplified uh, MLA hardware. On real hardware, you have a lot more devices and and stuff that that you won't hit uh, in the QMU environment. That I may understand. be the reason why you you are having problem with uh, putting on the on the on the real hardware. Uh, it's just that is something that the QMU didn't emulate, so you won't you won't see it when you put from uh, QMU. Great, I understand. All right, so Urvashi let us know that there is a breakout room for anyone that wants to continue the discussion. Uh, thank you, all the panelists, and thank you, all the participants. Yeah, thank you all so much for the session. I definitely learned a lot. Um, as Aaron mentioned, we have breakout rooms under the Expo tab for each track. If you want to continue conversations there, please feel free to go there. You can share audio and video. We have more track and uh, more sessions coming up in this track from 12.50 p.m. onwards. So we'll see you back here at that time. It's break time now. Thank you all.